So welcome to our first lightning webinar. Uh, we've been doing these for a bunch of different classes. A lot of folks are kind of stuck at home and uh, working from home. And we got together with a whole bunch of folks and been working on trying to come up with some uh, material we can present while we get ready to go sailing again here in a few, uh, hopefully a few weeks, but uh, whenever it's ready, we're gonna kind of get queued up and uh, make sure we have some good information for you all. Uh, a couple of quick things uh, for notes for you all. Um, just want to make sure you're muted. When you came into the, uh, the chat room, you were muted, or to, into the webinar, you were muted. Just make sure you're muted and your video's off. Uh, I hear a lot of people are kind of working from home and not wearing pants, and we don't want to see that for sure. Uh, there will be uh, the opportunity to send chat questions in during the webinar. Uh, just, uh, just type those into the chat box, and you should be able to uh, get that information uh, to us during the, during the, the clinic here. Uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff to cover, uh, but the first thing I want to cover with you all is uh, remember to pay your lightning class dues. Uh, talk to Laura in the class office. Obviously, we, we missed a fun time down in uh, Florida and Georgia, and we really were uh, really count on the... Uh, the Southern Circuit to kind of kick off our membership drive. And so we want to make sure that uh, everybody kind of remembers to register for the class. You might skip your mind if you were heading down to the circuit and haven't gotten to it. I know times are a little bit uh, challenging right now, but the class kind of relies on, on memberships to make sure that, uh, make sure we keep uh, everything rolling along. So again, uh, just remember www.lightningclass.org and you can go right online and click and pay your fleet dues and your membership. So uh, I wanna welcome uh, this week's guest, uh, Greg Fisher. And Greg is a longtime friend of mine, a longtime sailmaker for a lot of years, worked uh, at shore and then had his own Fisher Sail Law for many years before he joined North. Uh, left North a few years ago to go run the College Charleston sailing program. And now is doing uh, some work down there in the local Charleston sailing scene and doing some coaching and just sort of uh, support and sailing down there. So, uh, Greg, welcome. Thanks, Brian. Glad to be here. This is fun. Well, it's not that much fun, but um, anyway, kind of like sailing with you, right? So anyway, That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, we're going to kind of do go through some some things here. I just want you guys to kind of be aware. You, you, uh, I think we have over 360 or 350 people who kind of signed up for this thing, which is absolutely amazing, which uh, kind of tells you how bored we are looking for things to entertain us. Uh, so I just don't want you all to get your hopes up because uh, I just want to get you a feel for the kind of folks you're dealing with that are kind of presenting this stuff. Um, so this is Greg. And this is me, and uh, Leslie's back here somewhere too. So uh, this is the kind of skill set you're dealing with, with uh, kind of uh, what we're going to be uh, sharing with you here this afternoon. So uh, very special time, Brian. Yeah, that was one of the fun times, right? Mm -hmm. So I like the fact that Franz went right by us and didn't even seem to care. So anyway, <laughs> um, but Greg, let's kind of review. Uh, you know, you and I got together and kind of thought about what we might want to cover uh, in our first webinar. And we kind of thought that three or four different topics which you thought would be pretty good. And one was uh, talk a little bit about practice and uh, trying to get ready once the season kicks off. Uh, mm -hmm. Tacking and uh, more specifically building speed uh, after the tack. And that kind of has to do with acceleration and sail trim stuff. And then uh, the third and fourth sections, a little bit more detail about jib trim and set up and what we're kind of looking for with that and then uh, main trim and set up, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think, uh, you know, one thing that we were concerned about is we might be a little bit basic, but you know, of course the basics are what is most important. And um, hopefully this will lead to, you know, the finer detail questions and, and we're up for answering those as well. For sure, for sure. So uh, we're just going to go and uh, this is the first kind of section we talk about practice. I think one of the things you and I talked about specifically about this is that, you know, a lot of us are going to be coming off, you know, the long winter rest, plus the fact that, you know, we, a lot of us are kind of counting on the circuit to get sailing and 
as we're starting to see more and more regattas as, uh, as spring goes on, maybe getting either postponed or canceled, at some point we're going to get on the water and uh, well, we're, we're probably all going to be a little bit rusty. And so you kind of came up with some ideas that you think they're going to be pretty handy to kind of get folks up to speed as quick as they can once the new season starts. Well, yeah, Brian, just, and just a little intro into this. Obviously, we all appreciate the value of great boat speed or, or a good solid boat speed. It's important to get off the starting line. You know, it's important to, to have conservative tactics as a result. Um, you know, it's important. And we spend a lot of time when we can, all of us practice in our boat handling, of course, we like to practice starts. But I, I think what, what I've learned a lot this past few years coaching and spending time with a lot of people trying to make them go fast is that we really need to spend time practicing our boat speed. And obviously what we're talking about here is, you know, boat on boat, two or three team lining up, testing your speed, trying to go as fast as you can. And it only comes through practice. It's interesting that our college sailing team here at the College of Charleston, we spent as much time on boat speed um, as we did anything else. And it was really important. When you have good boat speed, you know, your tactics become much more conservative, like I said before, and uh, it just allows you to be a lot stronger. So what, what, what I want to go over here are just the basic guides and when we're setting up our, our speed testing session, you know, and in an ideal world, we might spend a couple days doing this, but in reality, we might just be able to spend an hour or two before a race and get out with a good friend of ours and, and go through the gears. And frankly, that's what we're going to really be spending most of the time on is nailing our gears and become comfortable with it so everything becomes second nature to us. But before we can get started, all the teams in this speed testing drill are, are sharing the same attitude. Everybody needs to get faster. You know, we all, I think while we're racing, of course, want to try to be faster and, and put our, our friends away. But here, if we're faster, the only way we're all going to get better is to share what we've learned or what we're doing to make the whole group quicker. And then we can step up to the next step. Before we go out on the water, we want to discuss the plan. What are we going to test? Um, who's going to be the control boat? Because in an ideal world too, one boat would set up per, let's say the tuning guide or per their normal setup, and they won't change much. And then the other boat will know exactly what they're going to try. It might be a new gear. It might be a little more rake. It might be more block down low, you know, whatever it is. And it's a very systematic, um, you know, set up going through these changes and, and working on them. And then the basic lineup that we've all seen before is um, one to two boat lengths apart and the weather boat is slightly bow back on the leeward boat. So if we sail into a shift, they won't roll over the top of the leeward boat and they won't be as apt to quickly drop down into the leeward boat's gas. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But then we start sailing and we sail until we see an apparent difference or we run out of water. <laughs> but the point is I'm trying to make is that we don't sail for three minutes and then tack and sail for three minutes again. We really need to give it time to develop. You know, as close as lightnings are in boat speed, you know, we really are going to really only see changes after, you know, I'm guessing three, four or five minutes sometimes. So once we see a difference, maybe one boat has a little bit more height than the other, or the top boat is a little faster and is a little more bow down, we line up and do it again. And maybe we line up and do it again. And if that change, that difference is still there, then we switch. And when our boat goes to the leeward position, the leeward boat goes to the weather position. Do that again. And if we still see a difference, then we switch drivers. And I think this is an important part that often we don't do because this is an opportunity for the helmsman to see how the other boat feels, to see if there are subtle differences in the way the boat's set up and go back to their own boat and make the change. And after we do that, if we still see a difference, then unfortunately, that slow guy needs to work on his technique a little bit. <laughs> but so, that's, that's part of the deal too. 
So one of the things I was thinking about as, as you're going through this, and we've done a bunch of two-boat testing, and even before regattas or whatever, uh, you know, going out an hour early and, and trying to get your bow next to somebody who's pretty good, um, I think one of the big things that people don't really necessarily focus on when they do this, especially people who aren't used to in two-boat testing, is that everybody really has to stick into their roles. Would you agree with that? And the driver has to focus on doing a good job driving, just like they're getting off the starting line. The, the forward person has to focus on the compass and you know wind shifts. And the middle person or tactician is really giving the feedback information to how you're going against the other boat. Exactly, exactly. And that's gonna be one of the next things we're gonna talk about, um, but you're exactly right. Um, don't hesitate as you're doing these drills, if we see a consistent difference to stop and change, um, you know, stop and discuss it and then make a change. And, you know, I didn't put in here the advantage of having a coach, I guess at the very bottom I did, but a coach can really help and that they can quickly see the differences and share them, take pictures, um, ferry the people back and forth between the boats. It really can make a big difference. In addition to towing people around or, taking their food or whatever it is, but the coach can really be an extra set of eyes. And then like Brian said, it's important to involve the crew in all the discussions. You know, their input's important, you know. Um, they got to be watching the wind shifts because, you know, a, a lift will make the weather boat look better and a header will make the lure boat look better. And we need to kind of be watching that so we know what's, what's real and what's just coming because of the wind shifts. But what I think is really valuable too is when we're going through this speed testing with our crew, we can, they can learn exactly what we need as far as a driver to make the correct changes. You know, like we'd like to hear, we're hopefully going, yeah, we're going higher and we're going faster, or we're going higher and we're going a little bit slower. I, I like to ask then, well, what's the net? That would mean who is at the end of the test, who seems to be the fastest, you know, who's making the biggest gains. But for them to be able to be comfortable with what you need to change the setup, to change the gears, to, um, to adapt is really important. They need to know the lingo. And then at the end, to get together with the group and debrief is really important. And, and I really suggest doing it right afterwards when it's fresh in everybody's mind before they kind of get worn down and are ready for the end of the day and um, and talk about all the different things that you learn, you know, and of course the coach will have taken pictures, video is usually really good and um, it is sharing, you know, everything that they saw and actually ideally leading the debrief. But there's a lot of opportunity to really make a lot of gains here. And, and again, boat speed is really important and deserves to have the same attention practicing as as anything else we do. Well, and that's, that's the other thing too, I think, Greg, is that, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a Tuesday night race, uh, you know, where you can get out 15 or 20 minutes early with, with some hot shot in your fleet, just to make sure you're competitive speed wise. And, and, you know, I think all of us have, have kind of, you know, hey, can you go up wind with me? Can you go up wind with me? And, and you know, it, uh, before regatta, but I think putting the, the work in beforehand, uh, even if it's for a half an hour or an hour before every fleet race, you kind of make that commitment. It's hard enough to find the time uh, for a lot of folks to get out and kind of practice. I, I'm, I'm always, uh, I've been somewhat envious of the, the folks up at the Buffalo Canoe Club. And after, you know, this summer, I got a little bit more of a taste of it. But, you know, a lot of the, the gang up there with David and, and uh, you know, uh, Tanner and Jenna, how much they practice and go out and, and sail against each other, which has gotten them so much better, so much quicker. And I think that no matter whether you're up at Buffalo Canoe Club or, um, you know, at Riverton or wherever, you could still make it happen and, and spend some time, even if it's a half an hour uh, every time you go out to find somebody to go make sure that you can, you can try something to make, the, uh, make sure you're going faster. So Absolutely. You, you made a comment, Brian, earlier that the cool thing about our class is that people are anxious to share what they know. You ask a question, they'll do their best to help you. And, and the switch in drivers, uh, it's really unusual that one of our better sailors wouldn't take the time to jump in with you to help you make sure you got your boat set up right. And yeah, I guess, makes... that, I guess that might wreck it on, on where you're at, right? I mean, might want yeah. to, might want, not want to do it at the Worlds or North Americans, well, but you know, at the, the no gas or, <laughs> or exactly. private tuning or something like that. So I'm sure that anybody would, would, would swap out and, 
and, exactly. and spend a few minutes with somebody else. So I know my crew would be anxious to get me off the boat. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, we just wanted to touch a little bit on that, and and I think more than anything, reinforce the importance of practice, right? And it reinforce the uh, you know kind of a system that you can work with. Uh, to try to get each boat and each team a little bit quicker and, and, and more consistent, I guess, right? Right, so. right. Uh, so next thing we kind of uh, touched on, Greg, was tacking and more, more specifically uh, about building speed, right? <laughs> and kind of what we needed to do with the sail plans because we're, we're always, you know, either whether coming off the starting line or coming out of attack or leaving the dock, you're always trying to figure out a way to get the boat to build speed. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. Okay. You know, it's interesting. We watched this video that's coming up here of, of Jody going, Jody, this is Jody practicing in Paracas before the Pan Am games, Jody, Ian, and Skip. And, um, and it's interesting. We're going to see some beautiful tacks. They're well-practiced. They're well-oiled. They do a great job. But what, what, what we're talking about here is not only the tacking, but this, you know, I, I would call it acceleration. I like the way Brian calls it speed building. And when they come out of the tacks, you can tell the boat really doesn't lose much speed. You'll see, as Brian said, the main and the jib are both eased, the equal amount. They're both eased. The leeches basically match each other in shape. The slot's symmetrical. It looks really pretty. But that part about evenly matched, I think, is the important part because when they come out, you'll also notice that Jody's helm is right down the center. And um, that allows the boat to accelerate straight on. So uh, I just want to make sure that we, uh, we've got some, uh, a decent uh, streaming here. We have a question, looks, Brian, looks about the video. Does everybody see the video? Uh, I see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting it, Greg? I, I can see it. I hope everybody can see it. Okay. Um, but well, uh, hopefully we we'll get some feedback. We uh, just uh, just so you guys know, obviously we're we're still getting used to this whole thing, just like everybody is. And we wanted to make sure we had some streaming video. We've been working pretty hard to try to make it work out pretty well, <laughs> so we can we can pinpoint some stuff. The other thing that we uh, uh, some of us have dogs. Mailman's and, uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, no worries, no worries. Uh, it's like a cage match. They're not all getting out of there by the end of this. Um, but uh, you know, the streaming video uh, was pretty, uh, pretty important for us to make sure that kind of works. So uh, yeah. Anyway, let's let's go back here, Greg, and maybe you can kind of point out a couple of things that going into attack, coming out of attack. Yeah, and, and we, can, we can get into the tacking again a little later, but what is interesting here is how smooth and slow Jody goes into the tack. Um, and if you notice that the tiller isn't really much over the side of the cockpit, so it's not like it's jammed over. The video is kind of small, but if you, what, what is most important here, I think, is the wake is flat. There's no big gurgle coming off the rudder, which would tell you that she's forcing the boat into a tack. And then when it comes out of the tack, um, we see she eases the main quite a bit. Now we all know that we got to ease a jib and we ease it to the end of the spreader or wherever, you know, to make the boat accelerate. But I think what, what we really see here is the importance of making sure the main is eased as well. We've all been there. We come out of a tack or we're trying to accelerate off the starting line or we hit a bunch of waves and we're struggling to get going. If the main's not eased to match the jib, then we put helm in the boat. And when we put helm in the boat and we have to pull on the tiller to keep the boat going straight, even if it's a, just a small amount, we're dragging the rudder and the boat will slow down. So again, this just shows, you can see here, her boom is leaving the traveler by, what would you say, Brian, a foot almost. Yeah, you know, every, the every change. Of, right. So that's the important part. Yeah. It, and it's and then, interesting, if I could just say this about a tack, you know, it, when we roll tack small boats like a 420 or an FJ in college, they roll so hard that often the rudder leaves the water. So when they flatten themselves out and squish it flat, if the boat isn't balanced, if the skipper hasn't eased the main to match the jib, then they really have to yank hard on the helm to keep the boat going straight. And frankly, as we watch them practice, 
often that's what we look for. Yeah. And you pointed out, Greg, obviously, I mean, they're, they're, they're still kind of finishing the tack and you can see how straight the helm got. The other thing I, I want to point out, we'll see a couple of pictures later on is that, you know, Ian here has done, you know, keeping that jib wick, uh, wicked twisted open and the leech profiles, how they match, right? Yeah. Like for exactly. acceleration. So we'll just kind of roll through this. Greg, what are your thoughts about how they came out and, and maybe more importantly, how flat that team is coming out of the tack? Well, that's a, you know, a, a great goal is to make sure the boat is flat, you know, and we talk about where the chine is on the water um, and the weather chine is just about touching the whole time. And we'll see more of that through this talk um, and how important that is. And, and they did a nice firm, I like to call it squish, where they flattened the boat out. And it was even, if you count, I think it was like four seconds after they completed the tack that Jody trimmed the main end. So she gave the boat the time to get through the gears and get up to speed. Yeah, it's almost like once Skip pressed the rail down, Jody, you know, followed suit by just, you know, pressing in, uh, pressing the leech of the main and, and load the boat right up. Exactly. They're going to roll into another one here. That was really nice. Yeah. And did you mention, Craig, uh, you know, again, the, the, the trim going into the tack, or did you want to wait and show that in the next one later on? Well, we could, we could touch on that, and I think we'll see it clearer near the end. Um, sure. But what we like is to help the boat steer up into the wind so you don't have to use a lot of rudder. If you watch Jody's trim in the main harder and harder, so it's basically almost too blocked, and that puts helm in the boat to make it turn up. And I think you used the term once before when we were talking, Brian, about the rudder then is just following behind the boat because it wants to turn on its own because we put more helm in. Right, load up the leech and just try to get around that, that uh, center of resistance. The other thing I, I just wanted to note really quick is, is how loaded the main stays through the whole tack, uh, almost to the point past head to wind. So I'm just going to run it here a little bit. And even there, I mean, the boat's head to wind, and you can see that it's still got load on the weather side of the, or what is the, the old weather side going to turn into the leeward side. That's really kind of helping it, uh, you know, kind of, point up and, and, and roll through it. It's pretty interesting how long you can keep that loaded up to help turn the boat. Right. And then snaps through, big ease to get the thing accelerating and going through. Yep. So we can step through, we go through a couple more uh, videos later on for sure, talking uh, more specifically about that, but uh, you know, I, I think the big thing about that was how smooth the tacks were, how little you use the rudder to turn the boat, using the sails to turn the boat. And uh, especially in that kind of medium light condition, how easy they were just to get the boat accelerating and both the main and jib, right? Right, and, and an equal amount. So the boat was balanced when it came out, meaning there wasn't any helm. You know, and, and I was gonna add, Brain, maybe that is something to check when you first come out of a tack is, just glance back at where your helm is. And if it's straight down the center and you don't have any pressure on it, that's good. If you look back and you've got it about a foot off center line, that's not so good. That's, that's good. That yeah, so uh, two quick ones here for us before we go on to jib trim. One is, uh, you know, uh, I'm not gonna, I could tell you the name, but a past North American champion uh, was asking about whether you think that they're rolled in the boat hard enough in this particular condition. Obviously, it's a practice session. I think you were, it's looked like they're concentrating more on the choreography of the sail trim and the turn of the boat. But, you know, how do you feel about how hard they were rolling the boat? I, you know, it's funny. I'm not a big uh, fan of super aggressive healing. We had a question from somebody else before we even started about the load on the board, you know, and, and the board and a lightning isn't a, shall we say, a hydrodynamic shape necessarily. I think it's easy to stall. And I, I feel, I, so I'm saying I like this amount of roll. I think if you roll too much, you can stall it and, uh, and detach the flow and then it's hard to get it rolling again. So 
I personally right. like the amount they're going here. Yeah, it's kind of hard to keep the flow, the laminar flow attached to the board. So obviously, you know, if you if you radically slam it around and and it has to reattach. So it looked pretty smooth to me. Um, you know, and the next question is, and I think it's actually a pretty good question. In, in this particular case, you could see Jody was easing the main 12 inches coming out of the tack, but that's going to vary a little bit on wind condition, more than a little bit on wind condition, right? And so what do you, what's your uh, kind of your indicator for how much you're easing the main coming out of the tack in that situation? Uh, well, and what are you trying to feel? I think it would just go back to that balance again. You know, we're going to put the jib where it needs to be to allow the boat to accelerate in, in whatever condition we're in. If it's blowing 15 and super lumpy, we'll clearly be at the end of the spreader or maybe farther out. That would dictate we'd be easing the main pretty far to balance it. You know, if on the other hand, we're sailing in flat water and it's blowing eight, you know, we won't have to ease a jib as much, so we won't have to ease the main as much to follow. But I think the driver has to feel the load in the, the helm and the load in the main sheet to know how far to go out. So it's hard uh, to say that, you know? Right, so it's not like in, in 10 knots, ease this much or whatever. It's just a whole bunch of things that the boat's telling you. It's, you're, trying to, you're going from a flat tack, let's say on port, uh, you know, and you're trying to get flat on the starboard or, or relatively flat as you roll through it. So you know, obviously you're using your crew weight to flatten the boat and uh, you know, only putting power back into it. So like I said, it could be you know, six, eight inches, could be 12 inches, could be you know, 18 inches if the boat's really stopped. It's just, I, I always use the idea that you know, when, if I come out of attack or if I'm trying to start off the starting line, it's just like leaving the dock, right? You don't just push off the dock and trim the main in all the way hard. You, you ease it off and get the boat going and then you can, you can trim on. So. It might be you know, a start stop kind of drill. So, yeah. um, which so anyway, let's uh, let's slide into into uh, into jib trim and setup, and we talk a lot about this. So hopefully, we have some folks who are, are are bow people on the boat, and maybe we have some things that you guys can kind of look at or what we look at insofar as making sure the jib is kind of set up right. So here's a. Uh, Here's the U.S. Pan Am team again, and uh, again, thanks to Greg. Obviously, we have a lot of images and pictures, recent pictures. Uh, Greg was coach of this team uh, during the, the games, and so I, was, I had a bunch of great shots. So uh, maybe your first couple of thoughts on, first of all, the overall picture here, Greg, which I think is a very pretty shot, and then what we're kind of looking at on the jib. Well, I think if we look closely at the jib, and I wish the picture was big enough, we could see the telltale flow, and we'll get to that here in a second. but looks like the leech of the jib's in probably four inches or so, which appears to be uh, appropriate. Jody's trimmed the main to the point where, once again, the helm is straight down the center line. The wake is flat. I think it's interesting to note how flat the boat is as well. And, um, and then the other thing that we were looking at too, which is pretty cool, is uh, Ian's looking up through the spreader window at the leech of the jib. Skip's looking forward for breeze, and Jody's focused on the left of the jib and probably the water in front of the boat. And you can see everybody's doing their thing and very focused. But I think, um, you know, you pointed out in the Tacken video how symmetrical the leech of the jib, the entry of the main is, and, and the leech of the main. And, and all of this has to add up to a nice balanced helm. Obviously, Jody's got a pretty balanced helm here. The other thing that strikes me, and I think that's the other thing I, I, I try to, it's hard to impress on people how flat they're sailing that boat. I mean, you were there. I mean, it looks like maybe eight knots at the most of breeze. It doesn't look all that terribly windy in this particular shot. You know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking because they have the uh, jib trim so tight, it's pretty flat water. Um, right. But boy, they're, they're leaned out there pretty good. Right, right. So we'll go to the next image here, Greg, and this is uh, maybe a little lighter. Yeah, a little lighter. Um, jib's clearly eased out. Again, I wish it was a little more perfect picture, but you can see we're maybe, what, about three inches, two inches from the end of the spreader. Again, wish we could see the telltale, but we'll talk about that here in a second. And once again, not to beat that horse, but look right where the tiller is, straight down the center line. And what is interesting about this that I, I guess I'd love to point out is they have heel here. And, and I bet you 
all three of them would say maybe they have a little more heel than they would normally have in this, especially in this flat water and medium lightish air. But Jody has trimmed the mane so the helm is still neutral. So whatever's going on with the heel, whatever it's going, whatever's going on with overpowered or underpowered, the, the tiller basically still needs to be pretty close to neutral. Right, and there's not, there's not any kind of backwash or anything coming off the rudder. So even though they're healed, maybe the chine's out of the water two inches or so. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not like the, 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 the rudder's just following the centerboard at this right. point. And that's, that's, you know, probably the best thing it can do is to get maximum speed. You know, again, I, I, I point out a couple of things that, you know, you talk about uh, tips for, for crew and stuff, how focused Ian is on the jib. I mean, he, he is zoned in to making sure that the jib is, you know, driving the boat and he, you know, he's probably tweaking it a few millimeters or a few centimeters every couple of inches, to, you know, every couple of boat lengths just to, just to keep that flow going. Right. So we'll talk a little bit about what the, what the key indicator, but you know, everybody's doing their job and the helms person's job in this case is hold the tiller straight. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So here's a boat that's uh, pretty flat and that's, that's great. Uh, but maybe let's talk a little bit about something that may not look as spectacular. Well, I, I think going back to what you were pointing out about the symmetric symmetry of the slot, that is the exit of the jib and the entry of the main or the leech of the main, leech of the jib. Clearly in this picture, um, Alan has a jib eased out to the end of the spreader. And, and we got to say this first before we go any farther. All these pictures are just a snapshot. So it could be that the jib just got eased out, or could be the main just got trimmed in, and we just have to capture it right at the right time so we can comment on it. <laughs> but exactly. what we see here is that is interesting is the jib's eased out to the end of the spreader. Main looks pretty darn good, but look where the helm is. Boat's still flat, right? We can see the weather chine is just touching, but we see a little bit of helm here. And two things, one, either we ease the main, and balance the helm, or we trim the jib a little bit tighter. And, and I got a feeling Alan would say, in this flat water, he would trim the jib a little bit tighter and go a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, in this particular case, and you can see now a little bit, you can see the, the telltale on that jib, which we'll talk about here in a second. But uh, that that's out, you know, spreader tip. And, you know, like I said, the boat's heading off a little bit, maybe he's trying to build some speed or the boat slowed down a little bit. But, um, you know, again, if you're going to head off like that, I think even Al would say, well, you know, in that spot, I might want to ease the main an inch or two if I'm going to try to work on building some speed. But on the flip side, really nice job of keeping the boat flat, right? I mean, that's, even though exactly. it's not that much breeze, that that is kind of kind of the goal. And you can see how, I'm not sure you, the pro trotter, but that, I'm assuming that tower is pretty straight up and down. You can see they just don't have very much heel angle at all. So. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I point out one real quick thing, Brain? Yeah, yeah. None of the pictures that we've looked at so far, we've seen Jody looking up at the main or Al looking up at the main. You know, they're looking forward at the water. They're looking forward at the left of the jib. And again, they're feeling so much of it in the helm, knowing if it's loaded up and they've got to make a change, ease the main, flatten the main, trim the jib, whatever it is to make sure the helm is very close to neutral. We'll talk, you know, talk a little bit about main trim in a, in a few minutes here, but that's actually the other thing going back to your practice um, pointers, right? Is that, you know, Al and Jody and, you know, David and all these, these folks are, that they feel the boat and they know that their setup's right and they know their speed is pretty good. So the boat is uh, talking, they don't have to take a, a visual image of the main and look at it. Um, all the time, they're actually, you know, can more focus on the waves and the, and, and the wind and the heel angle than, you know, because they, they have the confidence that the boat is set up right and their speed is going to be good. Exactly, so. exactly. And they get that through the practice, just like you say. Right. So let's take a couple, uh, pick, uh, quick look at a couple pictures of some jibs here. And uh, the first one that I get drawn to is, is the pic picture on the right. And the reason I, I'm drawn to that one is because that's what, when you're sailing the boat, that's where your jib trimmer's seeing it. You're, uh, unless your jib trimmer's laying on the deck uh, during racing, they don't see the one on the left very often. Um, obviously that picture helps us uh, 
understand head stay sag and sail shape and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But that's not really the image you're seeing when you're sailing. And one uh, on the right hand side is kind of the, uh, the trigger of what we're kind of seeing. And, and that image kind of helps us with a lot of things, right, Greg? I mean, uh, flow off the leech, head stay sag, and a few other, other items. Exactly. The cloth tension, everything, yeah. That's one uh, question I think we get a lot of, uh, or people focus a lot on, is the, that um, these marks on the spreader and how tight to trim in. And maybe share your thoughts a little bit about what you know, might be a maximum trim, what might be a uh, most extreme trim, and what the most important factor of kind of what that stuff is. Well, as we were talking earlier, Brian, I like the way you kind of categorize those as if they're a, a starting point, you know, like coming out of attack, the crew can give that a good eyeball and know they're at, like in this shot here, I think that's an inch and a half and three inches in from the end of the spreader. And you could say go three inches, go inch and a half, go to the end of the spreader. But those are good starting points. That telltale is huge. That's going to be the final guide, knowing that you've got it nailed just right. And, and you could almost say that in an ideal world, you'd almost be like hunting, if I could use that term, where you'll be trimming the jib, trimming the jib until the weather tail or the leech telltale would just start to stall. And then you just ease it slightly out until it flows. And that way you'll know that you're always as tight as you can go without closing the slot but you're never over trimmed. And there's never a point, when you say, Brian, where you want that telltale stall. I can't think of, I mean, you know, for a very short period of time, very flat water, mm -hmm. and you know, you tried to pinch Chet off for a minute because you finally got him behind you mm -hmm. or something like that. But you know, they, I, it, once you start uh, stalling this telltale, the slot's gonna close down and it changes the whole, what, what the wind sees on the wings, the sails. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the relationship between the slot and the and the and the gym and the main in, in a little bit here um but for sure uh you know people ask you know, how, how tight am i trimmed and i know you know sometimes we'll, we'll be sailing and i'll say you know how, where are you out of this spreader and you know leslie or, or laura might go well, i'm an inch in or i'm three inches in and i'll say okay you know trim it in more you know is this is a telltale still flying and that's what their their indication is always to make sure that telltale's flying and they'll, for sure, if I say I want it four inches in, they'll let me know for sure that that telltale ain't all flying anymore. So, um, but that's, if this is not flying all the time, or in, on the flip side, if as a jib trimmer, medium light air conditions, you sail at the Potomac Cup at the Doc Gilbert or something like that, and, um, you know, you're kind of shifty lake kind of sailing, you, that jib is in and out all the time. So, it's almost like flying a spinnaker a little bit with, you know, less, less throw on the jib sheet, obviously, but, you ease, ease, ease till it streams, then you kind of maybe trim it in a little bit and then kind of work that communication with your skipper. I'm eased, I'm outside the spreader tip, you know, I got to ease more to get it flowing and that kind of communication. Um, but if you don't have one of these on this, on your on your uh, upper jib batten, uh, you need one. Uh, Cause that's, that's your gas pedal. That's going to tell you if you're going fast, so. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Um, Picture on the left, obviously, like I, like we mentioned, uh, it doesn't really, uh, not something you're gonna see when you're racing, but it, uh, obviously a pretty shot, nice smooth sail. A uh, couple things uh, we talked about, Greg, you can see this top telltale flowing, and that's probably in about an inch and a half or two inches on the spreader tip. Um, and we wanted to talk a little bit about these these steering telltales, right, these these uh, these streamers here. And maybe you wanna to touch on what you're looking for uh, for, for those streamers. Yeah, and it's kind of fortunate, I guess, these two pictures match up because, like Brian said, we're an inch and a half in from the end of the spreader, and the picture on the right is roughly that as well. And one might say that is in the lower side of our groove, which means we are in, as Brian would say, a speed building trim, which is important, you know, especially in a lightning when we're trying to get acceleration going, like we talked earlier. So at that St that point we're steering low so both telltales will be going straight back that is the lure telltale will have flow over the bottom of it the weather telltale will have flow over the top of it and they'll be even this isn't necessarily pushing the boat to the highest pointing ability we have we are in a mode to accelerate and, and build that speed 
So as, one, as soon as the boat gets moving, and maybe we'll trim the jib in a little bit tighter to two inches, three inches, you can see the tape on the spreader here on the left side picture. Then we'd see the weather telltale start to dance a little bit more, which would tell us we're moving into the upper side of our groove. Right, Brian? And, then, yep. and that's where, frankly, you're going to be living I don't know, 70% of the time. And then, say, 15% 15, 15 of the time, we're going to be in the lower end of the groove accelerating. And in the other 15%, I added that upright, I hope. In the other 15%, we're going to be trying to go as high as we can, and maybe both telltales will be stalled. But the point is, we're never just steering in a straight line and the telltales are just a guide for us. Right. And, and, and obviously your jib trimmer being on top of that. So here's, here's something that can happen every now and again. Uh, you know, we're talking about this weather telltale moving up at 45 degrees, you know, most of the time and then maybe streaming back to get a speed build. What, do you, what happens on your boat when the lured telltale stalls? What, maybe I should ask Joanne, what happens on your boat she, when the lured telltale stalls? She'd be the right one. She would right. either say, push the tiller away and head up. Yeah. <laughs> or it may mean that we need to ease the jib a little bit. Right. Or if we really want to be technical, what that can mean as well is the jib is too flat in the front and it's like the, the groove is too narrow. But, but, but I guess your point, Brian, is that you would never really steer the boat with that lure telltale stalled unless there's something a little bit out of whack. Yeah, that, I can't really. To yeah, say? yeah, I can't really think of a time where I really want that lure telltale stalling. And and and, you know, if that ever happens, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, you got to ease jib, I ease jib, ease jib, and you know, then I'll get. Well, I'm already at the spreader tip, and I'm like, well, I can't turn the boat up yet, or whatever. There's always that communication going on with the, me and the and the yeah. jib trimmer. It's well, I mean, I call it communication. They call it whining. It's yeah. semantics, <laughs> but. Um, but I guess my point is, is that, you know, anytime we see that stall, we've got to make some kind of uh, adjustment because the boat's not going to go a whole lot faster. It probably won't go faster at all. And we're just sailed away from, from going upwind. So, right. It, um, it could be telling us, like you said, Brian, the, the entry might be a little bit flat. And this is on the technical edge, but I think this is important to think about, which would tell us maybe we got the back stay too tight, which means we've pulled back on the force stay and straightened it out. Maybe our wire tension's a little bit too tight maybe the cloth tension's a little bit too tight. And Brian, do you think this cloth tension here is close to being too tight on this pretty picture? So for me, and we, you and I talk about this because I get these, these crow's feet ideas from you, um, but these bottom two or three snaps, um, I think generally speaking for the conditions most of us sail in, uh, until we start pressing weight up on the rail, I'd like to see a couple little crow's feet out of these bottom two snaps. And for me personally, I, I don't mind this being smooth up in this upper section. Um, it, you know, if, if the draft's a little further forward, it's a little more forgiving to drive to. And, and, and for some of us who can't drive all the time, and, and you know, I, I just find it a little bit easier to drive to. I think if I've got those crow's feet, um, then I, I kind of know that I don't have it uh, on too tight. Uh, as the breeze increases, if I get on the rail, that's like, uh, that's like two people up on the rail for most normal teams. Uh, so once I start getting to the point where I can start getting into the straps, I usually smooth this slough section out all the way uh, with the cloth. Uh, again, I, at that point, if there's enough load that we're into the straps, the, the load on the jib, you know, high aspect sail, it's starting to get pretty severe as well. And the draft is starting to move back anyway. So we want to kind of use that cloth to kind of keep that, that, that overall shape, that, that nice kind of, uh, lead in here, a forgiving shape uh, to drive to a little bit. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, I know, uh, you know, the other thing too that, uh, again, to consider if you're, if you're sailed around with an older jib, maybe you have an older jib used for fleet racing, you, you may not want to have too many crow's feet here at all, because as the sail gets older, the draft, and when we talk about draft, uh, it, it, this deepest part of the sail here will have a tendency to move back. That's just not ideal uh, for where you want the, the deepest part of the sail in a lightning jib. And so I think that one of the things you want to do, if the sail is starting to get a little bit older and you use it for club racing and stuff like that, you may just want to avoid getting the, the luff too soft. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. That's what I was hoping you're going to say is as it's easier to get the luff too loose, the clock tension too loose than too tight, wouldn't you say? 
yeah. You know, the looser this is, uh, the, you know, the, the, the more the draft's going to move back in the sale. And you know, we talk about the slot, which is an important thing in the, in the Lightning. We'll talk a little bit about it. We're talking about the outhaul. But, um, you know, keeping that slot open is a pretty, pretty important thing to keep in the, the, the flow going through. You know, as Bill Fawdy would say, our beloved square boats are not really designed to, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of a tricky boat to get to go through the water consistently. And, you know, Chet always used to say, you know, every time the boat heals a little bit, it drastically changes what the water sees. So being consistent above the water line and, and the, with the sail trim is pretty important. So I'm gonna just slide on to the next one here. Um, boy, I'll tell you, I wish I had those, those anatocia, but we, a uh, couple of quick things we wanted to talk about here in these next two pictures. One is, um, and this is the Greg was talking about, this speed, this uh, high and fast kind of look where the, the weather telltale, that's a green one, is lifted about 30 degrees. And so they're, uh, they're kind of in that, that high and fast mode, I think. And then the other thing that, uh, again, we're beating a dead horse a little bit, but how flat this boat is, a uh, little bit of chop, but they're still sailing the boat flat. And Greg, you want to mention a little bit about, uh, you know, maybe what we see here in this section of the main is we're going to step into main trim here in a second. Yeah, that's important. Um, we're going to talk about this in detail. Um, the, the diagonal wrinkle just above the vision windows there, we call that the overbend wrinkle. And we'll get into that. You'll, you'll hear plenty on that, but I think that's, that's going to be an important tool. And then the other thing we wanted to mention, Brain, before we move on, well, first, as you point out, the left tension on this jib is not loose, and, um, and it looks very good, yeah. right? So... Yeah. Um, Clearly, I'm like, I'm like trying to get them. really close to my monitor. There might be a little <laughs> bit of softness here in that first step, but I, that's, I think, when you kind of got it right, you know, in that condition. Yeah. So, Yeah. And then the other thing that this is a lead into is the trim line on the clue of the jib. And you can just see like a dark line right there that is the perfect tool to set the lead position for the jib. And we'll talk about that here in a second, but it's just a neat shot showing that. Well, that's your point, right, Greg? This, uh, this, 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 um, this trim line, and a lot of us who've been doing it for a long time. I mean, I remember that we, we the tuning guides used to say, you know, oh, put your leads at ninety nine inches or put your leads at, at ninety six inches, and um, that actually became pretty inconsistent. And maybe we just touch a little bit about that as an old Lippincock guy. Maybe you can kind of say one of the big reasons we kind of went towards this this trim line. Yeah, I mean. You know, let's face it, jibs can be different heights off the deck. Some of us have different jib lead setups, whether it's different blocks or different tracks or different positions even. Um, our rake might be a little different, you know, and if you think about it, just an inch difference or inch and a half difference in rake can affect where that lead position. So the measure from the bow to the lead position really doesn't uh, apply. But if we do if we set the lead so it's a direct extension of that trim line, um, we're gonna be spot on every time. And um, one thing I just wanna add is where that trim line came from. Um, I think a lot of us might think that that came from some point, some percentage down the luff. And um, that's not, no, nope, we were actually out doing our speed testing, our practicing, and we looked at each other and said, man, we're going pretty fast right here. And we pulled a batten out, laid it on the uh, jib sheet, drew it right on the clue of the jib, went back and transferred it to, in the old days, to the patterns. And then Chad, in the new days, would transfer it right to the cut sheet for the, um, for the jib. You know, yep. now as it's cut off the computer. So it's, it's truly the right position for any jib you know, at any time, um, except what, would you ever say, Brian, in a breeze, you'd ever move it back at all? Well, you and I talked about this the other day, and I don't want to get too long-winded with it, but again, I think it depends a lot on crew weight and, and your sailing style. I personally don't move the lead back. Um, just, I, I end up doing it with twists, but again, I'm sailing around a whole lot heavier 99% of the time than, than most folks are, and when it gets to the point where we need to kind of Get the lead move back. I just prefer to ease the jib a fraction and get the uh, twist the twist the sail off at the at the spreader with the with the sheet. But 
for sure. I think in lighter teams, sort of flat water uh, venues and stuff like that, moving it, moving it back a hole or two, uh, but maybe not even a, a hole or two. I'm just going to switch the slide real quick. Is um, you know, you could do that. I think I think you mentioned you've done it, and I think that that's okay. The the problem stems, and and again, I'm going to reference Chad. Is that when this lead gets too far back, and you get too far behind that line, uh, what ends up happening is, and I'm sure everybody's had it. Uh, you start pulling too too far directly on the foot, and if you don't have the the sail low enough on the deck, the foot will start flapping. And so, uh, anyway, we um, we try to make sure that uh, you know we don't go too far behind that line. And the other thing I'm going to point out real quick is that this height off the deck here, there's different um, tack fittings on different boats, and I know we have a, a pretty large um, group of, of classic boat owners that might have a floating tack for their wire and this, that, and the other thing. And I think that if you, no matter what, you don't want this much more than, you know, uh, you know, on safe side would say maybe three inches off the deck from the tack to, to the actual deck itself. Uh, I think that that's kind of a good starting line. And if you're sailing a boat where you've got a floating tack scenario um, and this ends up much higher then what you need to do is go to the lashing at the top of the jib, undo it, and let the lashing slide down and let the, you know, lengthen the lashing so that when the, the jib is up, it's kind of in this three, three and a half inch zone. And that's going to, obviously, the higher the lead, uh, the higher the tack is up, the lead has to come back, and the lower it is, uh, the lead will go forward. So um, it just changes the whole aspect ratio of where the jib lays in the boat. So... Uh, a couple quick things here uh, before Greg steps in. Uh, it, there is uh, the chat box is open. If you send chat questions, I know we've had a few, and uh, we're, we're going to definitely try to get through them. So if anybody has questions as we're going through here, uh, feel free to, to send to the chat, and we will uh, do our best job to answer every question as we go along. So, but does that make sense, sir, Greg? You know, this, no, no, uh, I think I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. Okay. This is, uh, you know, actually Greg and I were laughing about this picture a little bit because, well, first of all, it's to say Pete. This is the old pier over here, which uh, should have been mostly done by the time we would have got there this year. And we were kind of saying, well, it's kind of sailing out of St. Pete, you know, to northeasterly at, you know, 830 in the morning. And, uh, you know, I, to which we both kind of said, yep, and it's going to die. So <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but uh, let me uh, let me just go on to the next one here. So that's a, that's a lot of the stuff we talked about, about, uh, about jib trim, and hopefully there's some good, good tips and, and useful stuff for people to start thinking about as we get closer to the uh, sailing season. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about mainsail trim here and set up. And again, if you have chat questions, feel free to, to, to send them in. Uh, if you have questions you don't want to send a chat in, you can always email us uh, anytime. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of stuck home, so we're looking for things to do. So. Uh, send us an email or uh, a text or whatever. We'd be happy to kind of answer stuff as we can. So talk a little bit about mainsail trim. And again, this is Jody and Yaw and, and Skip. And this is uh, also down at the Pan Am Games. And maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about the conditions and what we see and what we're trying to achieve here, Greg. Yeah, actually, the, the shots we saw earlier when it was lighter were um, obviously earlier in the day. And this is much later in the day when the breeze would come in and um, and this is just a real pretty setup. They obviously have plenty of backstay on. You can tell the top of the main is, is much flatter. It's open, which means it's the upper batten is angled outward from parallel of the boom. You can't see the jib completely there, but the slot is symmetrical. And uh, it's just a good lead in to show, um, I guess you'd say a, a, a good breeze on trim. Backstay, Cunningham, um, you can see the overbend wrinkles there just behind the shadow. So the only thing, and I got a feeling Jody would agree with us here, is this is a little more heel than what she might normally sail with. And, um, and two things. One, maybe she just would stick it up a little more, or maybe she'd let the traveler down. But if you look carefully, you can see, yeah, a little bit of weather helm here. And, uh, and again, this is just a snapshot in time, so this isn't fair, but it does show what we're trying to point out here. And compared to the other pictures, you know, we see a little bit of helm. You can see the wake off the rudder and um, balancing the boat out a little bit more. Even if 
if in this breeze it'd be hard to sail it much flatter than this, then maybe Traveler Down um, would help neutralize that's what, I was gonna, the that's, that's what I was going to ask you, Greg. How much breeze do you think you all are, are kind of looking at right here in this condition? Obviously, the main set up real pretty, and there's plenty of twist up here. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, you're 16 at this point, 18. Yeah, I was going to say somewhere 15 to 18, somewhere in there. No more, no more than 18. But um, but it was, in fairness, it was lumpy, obviously, as you can tell there. So, you know, you had to work the boat through the chop for sure. I I would say too, I, I, we, you know, talking about heel angle, and for sure, it's um, you know, there's more heel angle than um, than there was in earlier pictures. But I, I wouldn't want to scare folks out to say that that's horrible. Um, boy, I, I tell you, I think if I could keep the boat kind of at hail angle in 15 to 18 most of the day, I'd, I'd be pretty happy. And, you know, it takes a lot of work. We'll see that a little bit later with the mainsail trim, uh, a couple of videos we have. Yeah. But, um, boy, uh, you know, if if that's as, as, you know, if that's as good as it could get, I, I think, you know, you could get through most of the day in – be going just fine with the gang, I would think. So oh, yeah. I don't want yeah, I don't yeah. want people thinking I, I guess my point is that, you know, boy, if you can get it this flat and kind of get comfortable, and that's the other thing I wanted to point out too, is that um, and Mike Marshall brought this up the other day in, in one of his talks. He wants people when they're when they're hiking for him to get into a very, very comfortable position that they can hike and stay in that spot as long as they can for, you know, a large percentage of the beat. And he's not a big fan of having somebody hike and hike and hike and hike and hike and then getting tired and scooching their butt and scooching in, scooching in, and then taking a rest and hike and hike and hiking. He'd rather get you as far out as you can get and get comfortable, which I could see Skip's here. He's out, you know, cleared the TV screen for Jody so she could see what's going on. And, and they're all hiked out pretty good for sure. But, you know, wherever your team can get the most comfortable, because then it's easier to make sail adjustments to keep the boat flat, I think. And I thought yeah. that was a good tip that Mike gave me. So. Yeah, for sure. Can I say one thing, Brent, just real quick? Um, when we look at pictures like this, like we're saying, it's not, you know, the heel's good, but we have a little bit of helm. Maybe we could let the trailer down. And in another second, maybe all of that would change. And as a coach, I would say that this is why I really would rather use video because then you can watch the action of the boat. You can really watch the wiggle of the tiller, you can really watch where the tiller spends most of the time down the center line, et cetera. And with the iPhones that, or, you know, cameras and the phones we have today, you can pause it and you can see a picture. Well, frankly, this is a picture from a video. This is a screenshot of a video. So. You know, it's, it's almost too bad. We didn't know somebody down there who could have been videotaping this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Anyway, it's a great shot, and and uh, you know, that's kind of the the picture you kind of take a picture of and put it on your uh, frame it and put it on your, your picture. So here's uh, here's the, the team practicing. Obviously, not in the same conditions. Uh, this is probably up at the canoe club, right? Exactly. So, you know, <clears throat> once again, we're flat again. Tiller down the center, wakes flat, all that good stuff. Mains clearly fuller and trimmed harder. And we still see the overbend wrinkles <clears throat> just above the boom coming back to the vision windows. And we'll talk about that more here in a sec. Go to the next slide here. Sorry. So this is a boat that I'm familiar with. This is Steve Davis's boat. I think you sailed with Steve a little bit a couple of years back. And this mm -hmm. is uh, uh, into a new boat now, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about what we're looking at and sort of the keys, uh, visuals for trimming the main. I know earlier we talked about uh, Al and, and, you know, kind of, you know, knowing what the, the, his mast looks like and his, and his setup looks and having confidence that he's got the boat all tuned up right. So maybe let's go through a couple of things that we want to look at that make sure that, uh, you know, when you push off the dock, you don't have to be looking up at your main and making sure it's right all the time. So, okay. Well, you know, the first thing we were looking to show with this picture is if we are sailing in light to light medium winds, what we do with the Cunningham. And we can see the Cunningham's eased and the luff is basically loose up to the USA. We see wrinkles all the way up and down. Um, so that gives you an idea of the tension on the luff of the main and light air. Having said that, <clears throat> this isn't light air. 
Clearly the main's pretty flat. <clears throat> um, so we have some backstay on. And now we're gonna take it to one more level, I guess you'd say, technically. And if you look on either side of the spreader window there, we see big wrinkles coming back, maybe two feet, three feet back. These are telling us that the amount of Cunningham and mass bend aren't working together really well. And what we'd like to do here is pull on the Cunningham to smooth out the luff of the main to just below the spreader window. And the top of the main would look pretty. The overbend wrinkles down low would set up real nice to go just to the back of the window and we'll show you more of that. But, um, but again, the Cunningham's just a little bit too loose here, but it is where we'd want it for light air. <laughs> That's it, you know, that's probably a little bit, it looks like maybe they got a little bit of backstay on in this particular shot, right, Greg, is the mass is bending through here and, and. Yeah. You know, can I point out one more thing just to go yeah, yeah, yeah. a little more technical if, if we can, and forget the Cunningham and the left of the main for a second, but, you know, we go around the bottom mark and we pull on the backstay and we need to glance up at our main and kind of say, that's pretty close, or I got a little bit too much backstay on. If you look carefully up, in between the S and the A up at the top, we see a wrinkle up there from basically the inboard end of the batten to the luff of the main. That's telling us that we have just a little bit too much backstay on for this breeze at this moment. And we'd crack it off and it might only take even just two inches on the control line. So it's obviously not much, but that would put a little bit more fullness in up there at the top. The main would all of a sudden get real pretty and um, that's the final guide we'd use. Uh, it's not something that we're going to study it, of course, but that's just a good guide to glance at. Is that fair to and say? Then, I was just going to say, this is all, these are all things work together. So like, uh, you know, using in, in this case, the Fisher setup, you know, with the backstay on like this, this indicator up here, this, uh, this, this kind of overbend inversion wrinkle up here, that just telling you right now that the mass is bending too much and, you know, what would, you know, what would be the cure for that in, in this particular case? Other than ease the back, say, would you want to step on a little more wire maybe? You could do that. I, I probably in this, with this look right here, I'd probably just ease the uh, backstay ease the, a little bit. Ease the backstay. But you're okay. right. If you pulled on the wire, that would straighten out the top of the mast a little bit. Right. Well, you almost have to do both, right? If you ease the backstay, but you felt you're still getting a little overpowered. So, yeah. So maybe. Let's, uh, let's step to the next one here. And so this is, uh, Spain's bending pretty good here. Um, you know, maybe we, I think the backstay is definitely on here. Let's, uh, let's take a, a talk a little bit about what we see here mm -hmm. and the twist and these overbend wrinkles, right? Yeah, this is obviously clearly way exaggerated, but, but sometimes it's not unusual if we, if we don't glance up at the main in a lull and ease the backstay off at the right time. If we're in a really puffy, shifty condition where it's up and down a lot, it might not be unusual to see this every once in a while. And, and all we have to do is glance up and go, uh, and then <laughs> ease the backstay right. off and make the main set up. But the point is here, as you, as you sh showed, Brian, when the backstay's overdone, you, no matter how hard you trim on the main sheet, you're not gonna be able to pull the upper batten in parallel to the boom. You know, it's going to be open because the sail is so very flat up there. But those overbend wrinkles are just, just a guide to tell you that you've, you've definitely overbent the mass here now. Yeah. These, these are pretty interesting, indicative. I mean, once you, if I start seeing overbend wrinkles above the spreader window, I'm trying to make sure I'm making a change. Uh, you know, I, I, that's, to me, that's one, that means I've over flattened the sail and only if I've over definitely over flattened it down the lower section. You can see this this hard wrinkle here is I'm sure going all the way back to the clue. Right. And so um, anyway, uh, you know, but when you start seeing this, that means this whole sail is starting to really invert in that section. So yeah. All right. Let me uh, let me just go to the next slide here as I get a little bit more savvy. And maybe uh you got this picture in here, Greg. It's, it's so it, it's just yeah. um, obviously the other extreme. The mast is much straighter now. The backstay's eased off. The Cunningham's on too hard. 
And uh, if we had draft stripes on the sale, we'd see the draft is much farther forward in the sale. And, um, and it's not a very fast shape, basically, to simplify it. Um, and if we, if the picture went down lower, we probably wouldn't see the overbend wrinkles that we'd like to see. Um, so if it's light air and um, we need the backstay to be eased so the mast is straighter like this, then clearly the Cunningham just needs to be eased. So, you know, what we're seeing here is the Cunningham and the backstay work in tandem. And when you pull the backstay on, it's really unusual that the Cunningham isn't going to follow. And when you ease the backstay off, it's unusual that the Cunningham wouldn't be eased off to follow. Almost you have to, right? I mean, you're, when, you're, yeah. when you're bending the mast and, and bending the, the main and, and lengthening those cords, the draft is going to move aft. And so, you know, that's one of the things you pull on the backstay and the draft moves aft, you're, you're creating drag in the back of the sail. You've got to pull that draft back forward. So that you, yeah. it's almost, if, if you pull the backstay, you need to make a move on the Cunningham and vice versa and release it and ease it, right? Exactly, exactly. So this is a, actually a pretty good looking sail. This doesn't yeah. look bad at all. I mean, a little bit of a little bit of overbend wrinkles in, in the in the upper section here, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure if I'd be all that panicked about it. I like how the the, the exits kind of looks pretty and smooth, and mm -hmm. you know, for me, the big in, indicator again, if I'm sailing and, and I don't know anything about anything, if I'm looking and I see these overbend wrinkles back to, you know, the middle of the main window or just you know past the middle of the main window. Then I, I, I know I'm kind of in the ballpark of getting the mass set up right for the main. Yeah. Brain, we got a question about the Vang and the outhaul. And we're going to have some shots here of the outhaul. But maybe we ought to touch on the Vang because some people Vang sheet in a Lightning. And, and I, I guess it'd be fair to say I would think that most people don't. Okay. And what we're talking about is instead of using the backstay, upwind and breeze, using the Vang real hard. So, and, so uh, what's your take on that? Well, yeah, um, I'm not a big into the Vang sheeting because we have the Traveler and uh, I don't want to break anything. And Tommy doesn't want me to break anything. Um, I know some folks Vang sheet, it bends the lower section of the mast for sure a little bit. But I think for me, again, I'm sailing different than a lot of folks is that I have so much um, weight on the rail and so much throw in the Traveler that I'm not, I'm not that big on Vang sheet. I mean, we, we pull it on, uh, you know, breezy. We got three people on the rail. The Vang gets snugged up pretty firm um, mm -hmm. so that if I have to dump the main a little bit, uh, I don't lose the top of the mast and, you know, let the head stay sag. But uh, I don't pull it on. Uh, I don't Vang sheet like, you know, like we would in a flying Scott or like we did in some of these other boats. So, Right, right. I mean, yeah. Um, but maybe we could touch on that a little bit, Greg. I know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my, my watch here and we started a little bit late. And I apologize to everybody. We're just going to go a couple minutes longer here. I uh, just wanted to look at a couple. It's, it's a, a picture of Ched, Ched's main. Um, and that's obviously really pretty. We could talk a little bit more about these. I don't want to rush through it, but you, you, how pretty the overbed wrinkles come in. And you can see this one here probably coming right back to that, that middle of that, uh, that window. Yeah. So... Yeah. Uh, and then uh, this is a, a, a pretty clear picture of overbed wrinkles that have gone too far, right? Yep. And this is somebody who knows what he's doing. We're not going to name names. <laughs> I think that boat's from Wisconsin. But anyway, um, but uh, in this, again, snapshot of, of, of life here, uh, it's quite possible in this much breeze, it, you know, Todd sails with the M55A. He may have got stuck with a little bit too many blocks behind, or maybe that's the way he likes to sail. But I, I'm not a big fan of having these wrinkles go as deep into it. And what's telling me that he's kind of, um, you know, he's got the backstay on pretty firm is the fact that, you know, you can see this Cunningham is on, maybe I stepped all the way down, but he's getting to the point where he's going to run out of Cunningham. So if the mass bends anymore, uh, the draft's going to move further and further aft. So he could have got caught into a point where, you know, went out in eight and it turned into 17 and, you know, right during the race. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to speak for Todd, but I, I would expect in this particular little snapshot, that's probably not the way he'd be set up most of the time. At least mm -hmm. that's not when I've seen him. Um, you know, and Greg, you pointed out the difference between this boat up here, right? And, and Todd's, Todd's right. setup. 
Right. We don't see the lower bend wrinkles and we can see, even though it's pretty far away, there's a lot of depth in the main right where you're drawing the yeah, little yeah. cursor thing now. And yeah, there's so not much Cunningham on. So um, th we got the two extremes. And, you know, you ask at one point what Todd might do. You know, obviously it's hard to change the blocks now. Um, but what I might suggest doing in this situation, if we get stuck, is just easing the out hole a little bit. That'll put a little more depth in the bottom of the sail or bring the clue a little closer to the mast, which will help reduce those overbend wrinkles. And you certainly don't want to overdo it. You know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a half an inch is all you'd need, if that much, to help. That's a good point, too. I mean, if you get to the point where you, you, you missed the step, right, or you got in the wrong spot, and your Cunningham's all the way down and you're still getting these, you know, a lot of people I've seen them go to the Cunningham to try to pull the wrinkles out. And it's just the mass is bending too much and um, easy the out haul. I mean, Todd's got on bone tight. We're going to, we got two or three more slides. We'll talk about that real quick. But um, if you, if you let the clue get a little closer to the tack, it'll, it'll add depth to that lower third of the sail. And it's true, you know, it's not a long-term solution, but it might help a little bit to that, you know, have it not invert in that lower section. So. Right. Right. And there's a comment that um, Todd says he wasn't hiking either. But anyway, <laughs> story for another day, right? Get the, get the hiking bench out of there in Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next one. Actually, a pretty good setup. I don't want to spend too much time on this one, but we can, little good visuals of maybe this bend in just a fraction too much, but uh, maybe these are just bent a little bit too much. Would you agree? Yeah, and maybe a little bit of Cunningham is what we were thinking too, just to yeah, pull just, the wrinkles just, down to the spreader window. But we see Al's sailing real flat here, boat's yep. balanced, um, but yep. a little bit of Cunningham in this breeze so that the wrinkles were basically stopped just below the spreader window. And that's actually interesting. You know, with now that we have that floating tack, we've had it for a bunch of years, right? I think a lot of folks will pull the main up and the, the rope, it has a little compression in in, in the inside the the main luff. And so when that uh, tack slug floats up, people tend to leave it there. And so what I do on, on our boat is what I'll do is I'll uh, pull the Cunningham on and pull that slug down till it's kind of right at the bottom and then pull the outhaul on and kind of lock it in down there and leave, kind of leave the outhaul on and, and lock it in. I think if you see it that that tack slug is floating up an inch or two inches, um, that that's probably you're, you're going to be a little too loose and it's going to start, you know, pushing a draft to FSL. So right. um, I, I like to pin that, that, that slug down to, to the, right to the gooseneck. So uh, we're going to real quick, I did, we were talking about alcohol and we saw Todd's on really, really hard. And this is a, a image of the alcohol, which I think both you and I think is probably too east, right? Right. And that's better part of probably three inches. I think our most of the tuning guides say an inch and a half or, or two inches. And we have two shots here. We're just going to bounce back and forth. But we see how easy this is. And listen, we know it's not the same angle. But the point is, is I want, want you to kind of look at the distance between the depth and the bottom of the sail and, and the jib. And when we move on to this next slide, you can see this is definitely a lot tighter. And we understand it's a different angle. And maybe it'd be another another half an inch pull on that too. But uh, now the lower part of this main is much closer to the center line of the boat and this slot opens up. We talk about keeping the slot open, you know, in, in this picture, with the outhaul ease that much, uh, you trim the jib in hard enough and you sometimes get a little bit of backwind in the main. And so you add a lot of depth, a lot of drag to the main and there's plenty of depth built into the sail. You don't need to ease the outhaul to add depth to the lower part. When you ease the outhaul, and much more than this, uh, all you're doing is adding drag. And not only that, but you're also closing down the slot a little bit. So mm -hmm. what do you think about, I mean, you think this is probably just about as easy as you'd want to see it? Yeah, I think so, Brian. I think so. You know, maybe the only other thing we want to just touch on real quick is how often we adjust the outhaul. Okay, never. Never. Yeah. <laughs> so, perfect. It's, it, it's truly, unless there's a huge change in conditions, which would involve waves and breeze, I think you're going to adjust the outhaul. And, um, and even downwind, and there are people that would disagree for sure, but I think Brian and I both feel the same way. The outhaul is the last adjustment 
we'd mess with when we turn and go downwind. You know, it's, it's, it's gotta be pretty light. It's gotta be to the point where I don't like to use the outhaul unless we're, we're sailing angles and we got to push the pole forward. Uh, at that point, you know, it's, and it's maybe it's a little lumpy, maybe we're sailing at Cedar Point and we got, you know, it's a Saturday and it's gotten light and, you know, the, everybody from the, you know, it's using their motorboats. Uh, then I'll use the outhaul a little bit going downwind where I'm kind of playing angles. Um, and you and I have been through this, you know, you, the problem with easing it downwind is you turn to go upwind at the lure and mark and invariably you forget to pull it on. And right. so, you know, you turn around that mark and you just got this big parachute of dragginess in the lower section of the, of the main. And that's not, that's not all that spectacular, I don't think. Right. So just uh, slide on. This is the last one or two images. And again, we appreciate you guys hanging in. I know a few folks had to drop off and we went a few minutes longer than we wanted to, but uh, boy, we start talking and we can't, can't seem to stop ourselves, which a yeah. little bit. But uh, anyway, this is also leaving St. Pete, which I think we all wish we had been doing last week. But um, Greg, I, you gave me a tip in this picture, which I, I actually didn't really think about um, that much, but I do it. And I, and I just want to hear your thoughts about, you know, bridal height and, and what, how you kind of set it up. Well, I guess first, Brian, I just would want to say that I, I would look at the traveler instead of it being the tool to depower the boat, it's the tool to balance the helm. When we start to load up the helm, we let the traveler to lure to help balance the helm. So it kind of gives us an idea of really what we're trying to do with that. But we'll, we'll see in a video here in a second, and it's a short video, we promise, why we like to see a little bit of distance, like six inches between the block on the boom and the block on the traveler. And we'll show you that. We just like to be able to trim the main in if we're heading up into attack, like we saw earlier, or if we got a pinch for a little bit, um, it just gives us the opportunity to to over trim the main if we, we right. want to. And this spot right here, Greg, this you got maybe uh, four or five inches of, of, of distance between the, the boom or how much more sheet you can pull on, right? Right, exactly. Gotcha. Yep. So here's two, two different examples, uh, same boat, two different skippers. Uh, right. We have, it is uh, it is funny. <laughs> this would be Larry McDonald's boat, same main, different places, different people sailing it, but um, it's a good boat to test with. But um, so the picture on the left is my brother Matt sailing in a lot of breeze here in Charleston, tuning up with Jody before the Pan Am Games. Travelers down. Um, we mentioned somebody just asked a question about twist. We can see twist in both sails. It doesn't look it right here in this picture, but it's thumping pretty well. I'm guessing this is, was a solid 20 right now. So the traveler's down. We talked about waves and twist. This is gonna make the boat forgiving to steer and forgiving to get through the waves. Boat is still flat. We can tell the jib is not far off the end of the spreader. The other picture of Larry, and this goes to Gustavo ask about twist. So, you have to kind of look at it, but Larry has the traveler to windward here a few inches. He's eased the sheet so that the top of the main will open up. It's light air obviously here and pulling the traveler to weather will allow him to ease the sheet and get that twist. Notice how flat he is even in that light air and he, he was pretty speedy right now. Tiller right down the center wakes flat. I know we're beating that horse pretty hard, but of yeah, anything we say, that's pretty important. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's, it's, I was just, you know, we, you and I looked at both these pictures. So I'm like, wow, it's, it's thumping pretty good there with Matt to the point where he had to turn his hat around. And yeah. uh, which, interesting look, hopefully we'll see that again. But, uh, and how flat Larry is, that can't be much more than, you know, four knots of breeze in that one. And, and Larry obviously knows how to do it, but just trying to keep that centerboard straight in the water. and. You know, to, to Gustavo's point about twist, I, the other thing I, I want to point out here, which it's a great spot right behind Larry, is how the, the leech of the jib and the leech of the main kind of kind of really match up really well. They're both kind of opened up just about the same amount at the top third and uh -huh. match it up and keeping the twist the same. So anyway. That's good. That's good. We want to step on to the next one here. Do you want to mention anything else here about where, where Matt's traveler is and that kind of stuff? Or do you, no, I think, you... well, I think the thing that's interesting is he does have like six inches between those blocks. And yeah. obviously Larry has at least 
uh, has more than six inches between yeah. the blocks. So, you know, that just enforces, kind of reinforces what we're saying. That, but yeah, both boats that, are flat. I just, I just don't think we can say that enough. Yeah. So the other thing too, Greg, and you may have mentioned it while I was looking at my notes here real quick, but obviously to, to get the boom to center line and to have that extra three or four or four or five inches of throw, you need to pull the bridle to weather. Right. So you're, you're still focused on getting the boom to center line, which Larry obviously has the boom right over the rudder, rudder's dead straight. Um, but this, this traveler block is, you know, four inches, three and a half inches uh, to weather just so he can get the boom. And yeah. you know what, I, I've been, uh, you know, tacking the traveler, it, it could be a bit of a pain in the butt, medium light air, you know, like, uh, you know, the crew has to unclean it just so you can get up, this, that, and the other thing. But um, I think it's pretty important to be able to have, like you said, that access thing. And we'll, we'll show that in the video about why that's important. Yep. So, and Matt's stoking along there, and both boats really flat. So, all right. So this is, this is Matt again? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, you just maybe you could lay out a little bit. This is Charleston as well, and a practice day kind of training, which goes yep. back to our very first slide, right? I mean, here's Matt, who obviously knows how to sail lightnings, and he's out practicing. So yep. um, there you go. Yeah. And it's blowing hard. Not This isn't the same breeze that we saw in that previous shot, but it's pretty windy. And I think the reason Brian and I wanted to put this picture in here is that it's puffy too. It's very uh, shifty and puffy and it's just interesting to watch Matt work through that that um, that video. Hey, that's that's me. Okay. Hang okay. on. I'm trying <laughs> to make it happen here. So. Um, so there you see boats flat, helms down the center again. Um, Watch Sorry. the end of the boom. Sorry, no, that was me. That was, no, 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 no. Well, we got the picture. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. But it, gotta... if you, you can just see the end of the boom, I think one thing Brian pointed out here is that you can see this puff approaching. And when the puff hits, Matt has the main out of the cleat when it hits. And he lets the boat right there climb up into the wind, if you see that right there. It isn't like he's shoving it up. It isn't like he's trying to hold the boat down. He's letting the boat climb and then he eased the main sheet out. Look at the twist in the main up there. That's good. Yeah, it was, yeah there's two things I noticed there for sure. One, uh, and I think you, you pointed this out when we were going through the video. This little light spot here, you can see, you know, the boat's st standing up and the, the, the traveler's down a little bit. You'll see what Matt's next step is to, to get the traveler up. So let's just take, hopefully we can do that without changing the slide. So there's that little move, right? And he just loaded that boat back up and got it back on its, on its thing. The other thing is you pointed out, which, you know, I, I, when I've sailed with different folks, I try to tell them, you know, when the puff hits, there's two things you have to do. One is not fight it, right? You don't have to, don't be pulling the tiller and creating drag with the rudder. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is uh, you got to unload the sail plan so that you're not fighting it. And those are the two things Matt does. And, and Matt's really narrowed the window of how he's done it. You know, it, it's, it's very subtle. Uh, you know, it's a little bit of an ease on the main and just not fighting the rudder, just letting the boat kind of control, uh, you know, let the puff take in the boat up here. So here comes the puff and there's going to be three, two, one. He's going to let the boat ride up a little bit, ride up a little bit, ride up. There it is. Ease the main. And now the boat comes flat again, and then he can pull the bow back down and, and put load back into it. And it was very subtle. I mean, obviously, um, you know, like you mentioned, it's pretty shifty there. And mm -hmm. watching a world champion do it is a whole lot different than probably watching me do it. But uh, I just think it's a really good tip is that you don't want to fight the boat. And if, if it's trying to head up, what it's trying to tell you is you need to make an adjustment so that... Um, it doesn't head up and, and you don't want to necessarily fight it. It's amazing how straight he keeps the tether during this whole process and kind of, you know, he's kind of jerking it around a little bit, trying to keep the bow down a little bit, but he's, he's dumped the main off enough so that it's taken the load off and there's just a lot of twist in the sail. So for you history buffs, that's Fort Sumter to the hard left in that picture. We don't need to go back and see it, but just, okay. it's kind of cool. <laughs> okay. So, um, a quick question about traveler height, Greg, and maybe you can you can kind of address it. Um, how much can you change the height of the traveler off the deck, and and what's is there you know 
obviously wind conditions, how much your back stains you're pulling on. But what, what do you think the range is from the end of the boom in light air? How far is it off the deck and in breeze? And this is this is a pretty good breeze. And you know, we can see yeah. Matt's got it up, trimmed out pretty good and versus light air. You know, well, what do you think the range might be? In my humble opinion, this is part of the reason we always leave distance between those blocks because if it gets windy and our traveler's high, then we're going to two block and that's one more adjustment we have to make. Um, if there is a, an adjustment, I would move on my boat from the side deck to the back, you know, underneath the, the tiller, it would be the bridle height because it's not something we adjust unless there's a big change in condition because we'll pull the traveler to weather in light air or we'll let it down, obviously, when, we're, when we have helm or we're overpowered. So I think, I, I'm not even sure I could tell you, Brian, how yeah. high our traveler is, except that it's always going to be roughly, uh, you know, four to six inches between Away the from the end blocks. of the boom. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I got you. Well it's, good. well, it's a good question, too, because, you know, yeah. I think a lot of folks are trying to say, okay, I just want to, you know, or it's hard for me to adjust the height of my traveler, um, you know, some of the older boats and stuff. But if it's easy to adjust the height of your traveler, we're probably, I would, you know, like you said, I don't think your range of the height is that much different unless we get real, real, real drifty. Mm -hmm. um, we might ease that height a little bit because then just the weight of the boom, um, you know, it's almost like you'd have to pull the traveler stupid far to weather sometimes and that's i think that might be one condition we'd like the, the traveler height up a little bit and then like you said if the breeze comes on a little bit you've you know you've you've got the back stay on a little bit and you're stepping on the main sheet pretty hard it's still pretty important to have a few inches of throw just like matt has here um right. uh of, of adjustment with the main sheet so right right very good just run through this. This is a little bit full circle here with Jody t doing some more tax, I think. Yeah. And we only have two more slides after this, right, Brian? I think that's just about it. Yep. So, yeah. but that's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start it again from the, from the get go, but look at how tight she's trimming the main there going into the tack. And you see it's pretty easy coming out of the tack. And then once, uh, once Skip presses that rail down, Jody's able to put all that horsepower right back in with the main sheet. I think they go into another one here, right? Yeah. And if you notice how slow the first part of the tack is, I think that's really important. It makes it easy for her to keep the boat balanced when she comes out and she eases the sheet out. Trimming the main hard right there, helping the leech yeah. the main, turn the boat. There Big is ease. Two, two blocked right there. And there you see, what is it, a foot and a half off the traveler yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. Cool. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Just gonna run this one through one last time. Big tight. Keep the leech load on, and then just dump the leech load out. And just like you're leaving the dock, get that sail twisted and get the boat back up to speed. Skip and Ian are gonna press it down, and now Jody's gonna whoop, pull that main right back in. Nice. It's a nice look. Yeah. All right. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I appreciate folks coming on and saying, we don't have anything else to do, so we'll listen to you guys, but <laughs> we've been going on for about an hour and a half, and, uh, you know, uh, we'd love to cover more stuff for folks. Uh, we could do that. Uh, uh, I know I'm stuck here in Connecticut for another month, month and a half, probably, and uh, so it's social distancing with four adults in the house now, I, I think I mentioned it. It, it could be a steel cage match, but we're all not getting out of here. Um, but we'll see what ends up happening. But in any case, I um, want to just go here to uh, talk a little bit about maybe some non-sailing stuff of but your involvement in the class. And I uh, want to talk a little bit about the boat grant program that I know that you've been volunteering your time uh, for the past couple of years of the boat grant program. And I just want to ask you maybe to talk a little bit about the program and uh, what's going on these days with, with, the, with the boat grant. Well, thanks, Brian. Um... Yeah, I'm very honored to be able to serve on that uh, that committee. It's 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 a great program for the class, as we all know. Um, everybody's very proud of it. Other classes try to emulate this. Other classes in yacht clubs try to emulate the success that they that the Lightning class has had with the boat grant program. And you know, we got to say, 
thanks to those that really worked hard in the very beginning, namely Bill Pasigi and Alan Terhune, to really put this thing together. And there were other people working with them, but, but those two especially really worked hard. And then the other thing we got to say is thank you to all the people, especially in the early days, that donated their equipment, whether it was a boat or sails or pieces or parts or time, or they were a mentor to the program or just their philanthropy and supporting it and making it run smooth the way it does is a huge part of the success. Um, and it's a, it's a deal all for the class. I mean, everybody supports it. And um, I think you guys all saw, hopefully, the, the press release Laura sent out last week. We've got three great teams again this year. We got another all women's team, which everybody thinks is super. Um, this is excellent and um, means a lot to the program. And what's really cool this time that I'm especially excited about is almost all the sailors on these three teams are very active college sailors. And that's the demographic that we're really aiming at to bring into the class and make members in our class. And you know, we know that's really important. So we're, we're proud of that as well. And um, um, I lost my train. Well, there's a lot. There's oh, a lot oh, of. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. What I one, wanted to say. One is of us has to talk. We're live. Yeah, sorry, sorry. But the other <laughs> thing that we've done recently that I think is exciting is we've really upped the equipment. Um, we have had two boats. Both boats have been refurbished, so they are in excellent condition, ready to go race hard. And uh, we've actually bought a brand new boat that we'll take delivery on this summer from Tommy. And we've gotten all new sets of sails last year. So it's just one more opportunity to bring the program up to a level that when, when the kids come into this and they want to race against everybody, they have excellent equipment that will allow them to compete at the highest level. So first, just again, just to say it, thanks to everybody that's helped support this program. Um, we really do appreciate and look forward to your support as we go forward. It's a great program. And, um, you know, when we've been at the North Americans and regattas and we see the numbers of kids sailing under 30, it's just huge. So yeah, it's kind of I fun. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. There's, there's a few other volunteers in the boat grant program. Maybe you, I know uh, uh, Maddie's evolved still, right? Yep. Maddie and Laura's a big part of it. Bill Fastigi still a part of it. Bill Foddy, Carl Allen, and Caroline Patton, who is a former boat grant um, member herself. And what's kind of cool about Carolyn, her all women's, the, the all women's boat grant team are all University of Vermont sailors and Carolyn's the coach there. So it is, uh, it's pretty cool. It is cool. Well, I appreciate your uh, volunteering to do it. Obviously the class couldn't uh, have a better person kind of uh, helping that whole program uh, go, go together. So the other thing that I, I, would, I do want to mention, and I'm going to circle back to this, is the importance of everybody getting online as soon as we get off. Uh, hopefully um, you've had a glass of wine or two and you're feeling a little bit uh, happy about uh, maybe spending a little bit of money and paying your class food today. And boy, if you want to, there's a whole bunch of opportunities to, uh, to uh, fund any of the different type of uh, programs. The, the boat grant program, I know we have a bunch of funds and so if you have an extra 10 or 15 or dollars in your wallet and you want to support the class, uh, you know, these are going to be a little bit challenging times which we're going to kind of try to get over the next couple of months. And uh, if we can't, uh, you know, keep it lower in the class office supported and making sure we're ready to go out of the gate and uh, hit the ground running as soon as, uh, as soon as we can get back on the water with a stable foundation would be great. So, uh, Greg, uh, Appreciate you. Love you. I thank you very much for, for doing this today. Um, you know, I know that uh, you and I uh, tried to put a lot of work and time and effort into making sure this all came off pretty well. Uh, we had a couple hiccups at the beginning, like when my internet crashed, but uh, it's all part of this whole new normal. But uh, I also want to thank uh, Laura Christostomo, who's uh, kind of our producer behind the scenes. Laura does a lot of work for, uh, for North Sales insofar as a marketing department and trying to keep all these webinars running. And she just does an amazing job of, of, of keeping us all, all in line and trying to make these as fun and professional as possible. So thank you guys both. Um, uh, we're going to try to do another one in two weeks. I think Ched has finally come north from his uh, Miami sabbatical of hanging out there in Miami with Bill Mock and sailing every day. 
And so uh, I think he's back in Connecticut. So probably in about two weeks, we'll probably do another one. We'd love to hear from you topics you want to hear about. I know a couple of people sent some questions in. Uh, we will definitely touch on all those questions that got sent in for the next one. And uh, we will, uh, any, anybody else that says, hey, you know, I'd love to hear more about this or, you know, can we talk about this? We'll, we'll, we'll touch on any subject you want. And uh, so we, you know, like I said, probably about two more weeks and uh, we'll try to get Ched and uh, maybe, you know, if Greg's still sitting around, maybe he'll come on board as well and answer questions. We'll, we'll get our next, uh, our next victim, so to speak, uh, lined up for you here in a week or so. So again, thanks everybody. Greg, thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. Good job putting this all together. And Laura, thanks for making it happen. And thanks to everybody for joining in. Um, certainly we all hope we'll be out on the water sooner than, than we're being told. All right, guys, so do me a favor, be safe, everybody, and uh, check in, uh, email me questions, and uh, we will see you soon. Uh, this is uh, the Lightning Webinar signing off. Be good.